So what's your favorite neighborhood in Paris? The Marais, which is uh, Le Troisième, and it is not touristy at all. And I think that is was very special to me because you just have local Parisians there, you have local shops. I think some of the best food in all of the city is in the Marais. Hi, my name is Lev and welcome to Planet, the travel podcast where we give you inside tips and practical advice for cities around the world. We'll speak with experts and locals to help you make the most of your global travels. In this episode, we'll talk about Paris. First, we'll give you a quick intro to the city. Then, we're lucky enough to have writer and French translator Janessa Abrams to give us a local's perspective. At the end, we'll give you some practical tips for planning your trip and advice on how to visit Paris without spending your life savings. Paris is called the City of Lights and is known as one of the most romantic and culturally rich cities in the world. Whenever I travel, I always find it helpful to have some background on the city before I go. So before we dive into the trip planning and local tips with Janessa, I'm going to give you the history brief. Here's a history of Paris in less than 60 seconds. Paris started to become a bustling city in the 1200s with construction projects like the Notre Dame Cathedral. In the 1500s, Henry IV helped Paris build roads and parks and promote a religious tolerance. But Paris took a big step backward when Louis XIV, a.k.a. Louis the Great, a.k.a. the Sun King, took over in the 1600s and consolidated all the power to his luxurious palace in Versailles. No one liked this. Take one look at Versailles, or even the Louvre, which used to be a royal palace, and you'll understand why some people were pissed. The guy's bathroom was covered in gold while people were starving on the streets. Louis XVI tried to enact some reforms, but the French nobility resisted change, and Louis XVI's indecision and ineffectual ruling made him and his wife, Marie Antoinette, look like the bad guys. In 1789, Parisians stormed the Bastille, a symbol of royal authority in Paris, and that set the French Revolution in motion. After the dust had mostly cleared from the Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself emperor at Notre Dame Cathedral in 1804. That wasn't exactly what the Parisians had had in mind, and when Napoleon was defeated in exile just ten years later, Power changed hands a few times and went through various levels of democracy. By 1889, Paris was prospering, and the Eiffel Tower was built at the centennial anniversary of the Revolution. Unfortunately, France got sucked into World War I. The cheap post-war Paris, though, attracted a lot of artists in the 20s. After being occupied by the Nazis and decimated by World War II, Charles de Gaulle rewrote the Constitution in 1958, establishing the current republic. Paris is now a successful, tolerant, central hub of Europe. Now, before we get to the sites, let me give you a quick geographic overview of the city. Paris is cut in half by the Seine River. On the south side, you have the left bank. That's where the Eiffel Tower is. On the north side, you have the right bank, where most of the museums are. On an island in the middle of the river between the banks, you have Ile de la Cité, an island with the famous Notre Dame Cathedral. Now let's get down to it. We believe the tips from those who really know the city can make all the difference. So today we have Janessa Abrams with us. Janessa is a writer and French translator with a Master in Fine Arts in Fiction and Literary Translation from Columbia University. She's a Norman Mailer Fiction Fellow whose work has been published all over the place, including the New York Times and Tin House Open Bar. She spent a lot of time living and working in Paris, and we're really lucky to have her today. Hi, Janessa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you're a French translator. What are the challenges from translating from French to English? This is terrible to say, but French is a much more beautiful language than English. <laughs> Um, I think there are also some subtleties that the French can get away with that sound a little silly in English. For example, the word like. The French have a very lovely way of moving between ideas. And when we say like, it sounds a little bit childish. Can you describe sort of that way of moving between ideas? They say quoi a lot, which means what, or que. And there's sort of, there's something about the sound of French that I think you can, there can be a lull and it feels like you're thinking in a much deeper way than perhaps English. I think we're a little rougher around well, the edges. Like is also very, uh, like a hard sounding word. Mm-hmm. It's, aggr- it's a little bit aggressive in a way that French I think is a little lighter. Okay. So let's get started talking about the sites now. We're going to play grade it. So I'm going to ask you to get a grade to each of the top museums, historical sites, and activities that will appear in most Paris guidebooks. Paris is really overwhelming. There are about 30 major sites, so hopefully this will give everyone listening a better idea of what to see depending on the length of the stay, but we can't cover absolutely everything. There are a ton of museums, so let's start with the biggest one, the Louvre. What grade would you give to the Louvre? An A. Why would you give an A? Uh, It's the Louvre. Uh, There are some incredible pieces, obviously the Mona Lisa, uh, but it is quite overwhelming. Uh, There are four different sections, and to actually accurately go through them, you have to spend an entire day, and you are 
quite exhausted at the end of it. So you might sort of not give as much attention or love to the last few that you do. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think it's really overwhelming. And <laughs> the, people focus on the Mona Lisa. There's mm. a lot more to see on just, than just the Mona Lisa. I would give it an A+. Plus. Mm. I bounce back and forth between A and A+. Plus. <laughs> Ultimately, went with A+, plus just because there's so much of the most famous artwork that's ever been created in human history. And I think it's so cool mm. to have all that in the same building. That's true. The variety, yeah. I think, is quite nice. If yeah. you're not into Italian work, then there's so much else. There's a lot of Egyptian art. That's quite amazing as well. Yeah. So I took an art history course in high school, and just everything that we learned from that class was in the Louvre, and I thought that was really cool. I would I would say, for my personal taste, there are a lot of mother-daughter paintings, and those <laughs> are my absolute favorite paintings in the whole world. Uh, and I recently was in Paris and discovered the first ever mother-daughter painting I had seen as a child there. And so maybe maybe it gets an A+. Plus. I don't know. I'm in between. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you about it being really exhausting. So mm-hmm. we recommend that you either do it in two trips mm. because it's a little more manageable. And also pick something you want to see. Pick maybe a few different exhibits that interest you. Don't try to see the whole thing because you mm. can't. It's just so big. That's true. And something that I think is quite horrible but other people might like is they recently opened somewhat of a shopping mall underneath the Louvre. Uh, there, now there's another entrance, so the lines are much shorter, and you can get more food, and you can sort of spend some time doing non-art things, and then return to the Louvre if you want to do that. Okay. Um, it's sad to me <laughs> in a materialistic way, but I think it probably makes it a more digestible trip. So pros and cons to that. Mm-hmm. Okay, next up we have the famous Impressionist Museum, the Orsay. What would you use a the plus. Orsay? So this is just solid absolutely a plus. solid A plus. Okay, why? Um, the building is so beautiful. It's a converted train station, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something about that architecture that is quite strange. And there are all these little rooms that you see the artwork in. So it feels really intimate. And I think I just, I like the painters that are featured there perhaps more than in the Louvre. Yeah. I would also give it an A plus. This is probably my favorite art museum in the world. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) I went with my cousin. We... Went through the whole thing in about two or three hours, and then we just decided to go back the next day. <laughs> Even though we had to see the whole museum, we just thought it was so amazing, the mm. quality of the paintings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it basically starts the, where the Louvre ends. The Louvre goes mm. really up through 18th century art, and then the Orsay picks up with French Impressionism in, in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, so you sort of, if you see both one after another, you get the full scope. And as you said, the building is really beautiful, and the layout of the paintings in the museum is great. You can get and, really close to them. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they're also, it's even though there's so much there, it's laid out in a way that you can really focus on one painting at a time. Mm-hmm. It just has all the best paintings from Impressionists that you would think of. I was escorted out of the Arce because uh, they were closing and I really <laughs> didn't want to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I can't say enough about it. It's amazing. Yeah. Next up, we have the Orangerie. This is a small mm-hmm. museum that houses Monet's large water lily paintings, and it's this peaceful, open gallery. What would you give to that? In A, with a moving towards A+, plus, but an A, Ooh, I think. Okay, why? It's pretty strong. Um, I think there's something kind of amazing about it. You're completely surrounded. It's a bit breathtaking, but it's obviously small, and there's quite a long line, and it's only open during certain seasons, I believe. Yes, as you said, they're all around you. Mm-hmm, yeah, so it's a circle, and so you're kind of in, you're in this, you're completely... Um, in this space, but also interacting with the art in a way that's quite beautiful, but it's also a very odd... It's odd and magical at the same time, which is a weird combination, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I just think just, you see the water lilies all the time, just so that's famous, true. and mm-hmm. it's, that's really cool just to see them in person. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you that this space, is there's something great about just being surrounded mm-hmm. by art. I think if I remember, the, the walls are white, mm-hmm. except mm-hmm. for the paintings, so the colors just really pop on mm-hmm. the water lilies. I'm going to give it an A-, just mm. because I think there are so many great art museums in Paris, and this one really doesn't have much to see except for... Yeah, you have to love Monet. Things. That has to be... Uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. better mm-hmm. if you love Monet, and there's, it's just a small museum, so mm-hmm. I'm going to give it an A-, even though it's great. Mm-hmm. No real complaints, just there's, there's just so much to see, mm-hmm. and this only has a few of the amazing paintings. Mm-hmm. Next up, we have the Rodin Museum. So this is an impressive collection from one of the greatest modern sculptors, what would you give the Rodin Museum? A B plus to A minus. Okay. Only because of personal taste, because sculpture speaks to me less, I think, mm. than paintings. Okay. But it is beautiful. Yeah, I'm also going to give it a B plus. 
If nothing else, I think it's worth to take a walk around the gardens, mm-hmm. which have some of his most famous pieces and also just, it's a beautiful setting. I think it's better that way to be outside with them and sort of just be living with sculptures. That's sort of how they should be interacted with. I think I have a, a more difficult time being forced to have a formal response to a mm. sculpture. Yeah, so I think that was that was one reason why I really like the Rodin Museum, is that it had the outdoor section. Next up, the Pompidou Museum. This is a modern art mm. museum, one of the best in the world, certainly the best in Paris. Yes. What would you give? An A. Okay. I think an A moving to an A+. plus. I Ooh. can't make up my mind. <laughs> um, I lived very close to the Pompidou, um, so I got to visit in little spurts, and I think it's very interesting t- to see... It feels very techy in a way that's so different than all the other French art that you see. Um, I think it's it feels very alive, so that's why I like it. It's maybe not always my style or aesthetic, but there's a lot to think about. Okay. The, the paintings themselves are a lot of them really famous, but the building is also really cool. Mm-hmm. The architecture, I think that's part of what you're referring to. Mm-hmm. It's a form follows function style, which is very modern. Mm-hmm. Exoskeletal, all the supports and stuff that's usually in the inside of the building is on the outside, mm-hmm. which is unique and really cool to look. It's sort of like Notre Dame, actually, in the same way, mm-hmm. where the flying buttresses are on the outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it sort of mimics that, but in, obviously in a more modern way. Mm-hmm. The actual paintings caused me to give this an A-. Mm. Um, while, it's, while it has some famous work and mm-hmm. some great works by some great artists, I'm not a huge fan of modern art at all. Yeah. And so the first, like the top floor, which has more early 20th mm-hmm. century, mm-hmm. Marc Chagall, Kandinsky, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Once you get two floors later, you're looking <laughs> at a plastic globe that has a hole punched in it. And That's what I meant by... Little, it's a little confusing. <laughs> Thought-provoking, but not necessarily yeah. my or aesthetic. a large room with nothing in it but a grand piano. I kind of like that, but yes. You like that? <laughs> I kind of like that idea. Yeah. Is that it? Have you, that did you there. see that? I wasn't there. Was okay, yeah. you didn't make it up. Okay. Yeah, I kind of so like that. So it's interesting, <laughs> but... I think if, if, if you're not kind of, if you're not into that thing, you can definitely be turned off by some of the mm. more modern work, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. particularly the, the globe with the whole punched in. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I don't think there's a cohesive style about the museum, which is, good, which is good because then you won't be completely turned off by everything, but it's also hard, I think, for a whole experience. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. So A minus for me, A plus for you, but it, it's certainly... A to same. A plus. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Last up is I have the Marmottan Monet Museum, mm-hmm. which is not covered by the museum pass. It's sort of a schlep to get there, but if you're a Monet fan, you definitely shouldn't miss it because it shows the progression of his career from his early training to when he went blind at the end of his life. His paintings became much more abstract at the end, and it has all the masterpieces from mm-hmm. the beginning, the end, and in between. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for a complete Monet collection, I think it's worth it, even though it is a lot of the way and it's not covered by the museum pass. It has some of his best work, mm-hmm. and I'm a huge Monet fan, so I enjoyed it immensely. Um, as for the Picasso Museum, the Jewish History Museum, the World War II Museum, and the Cluny Museum, so many museums, <laughs> uh, which has medieval art, the Cluny Museum, and the Carnivalet, which has city history, all those are specialty museums that are worth visiting if you're interested in those specific subjects, but if you only have a few days in Paris, we suggest sticking to the site discussed. Mm-hmm. So now we have non-museum sites. And there, there are so many museums in Paris, but there's also a lot of other stuff to do. So let's start with the Notre Dame Cathedral. What grade would you give to that? A minus. Okay, why? Uh, the first time I went was quite magical. Uh, I didn't realize, but it was right where... It was right as the bells were tolling and things got dark at sort of like the light was very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got to see a little bit of a service. And so I think mm. it was by virtue of of the randomness of my visit that it was enchanting, but other times I've been back, um, there are quite a bit of tourists. Um, and so it's not the most convenient place to sort of look around at what is a very magnificent building. I'm going to give it an A plus. I think it's Mm. as campus as any of the other sites in Paris. Mm. It is really touristy, but if you go on the really early side, you can Mm. beat the rush. Mm -hmm. I also went at the end of the day towards sunset Mm. around dinner time and it was a little less crowded then. So I think there are times that you can go Mm. to sort of have a little more peace and quiet there. Just the combination of the climb to the top, beautiful inside, Mm. and the elaborate exterior, it just Mm. makes for a a great sight all around. 
Um, it's also cool if you saw the Hunchback of Notre Dame mm-hmm. Disney movie. <laughs> I think what you said about Tour Zone, though, is something you can probably apply to all of Paris in the same way that you kind of with New York. Of It's all about when you plan your trip and when you go to visit the sites because it can be a very touristy place. But if you hit it really early or really late or go on an off-season, it can be really intimate and incredible. I agree. The Louvre is hopeless, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to yeah, find a time no. for the Louvre. So. No such luck. Yeah. Oh, there is one night a week um, where the Louvre stays open extra late. That I think, obviously, the, the night owls probably all hover yeah. during that time as well, so it'll still be crowded, but yes. Yeah. Something else about Notre Dame, which I love, Victor, Victor Hugo writes in Hunchback Notre Dame that up in the bell towers of Notre Dame, you'll have Paris at your feet. I like that quote, and especially particularly for me, because I saw sunset from when I went to climb Notre Dame, and mm. you can just sort of see. You get a really nice view of Paris. You get a 360. You can walk all the way around, so... That I was think a great experience. because of the windows too. I think Notre Dame. You should time it based on the sun, whether you're climbing or not. Great. Uh, later in the podcast, I'll tell you a little more about Notre Dame Cathedral and how to make that visit. Up is Saint Chapelle. Would you give to Saint Chapelle? Uh, I think an A minus. Okay. I have only visited once, and it was lovely, but not something that I have really distinct memories of. I'm going to give it an A. I actually. It was one of the most memorable sites for me. Mm. Uh, This is the Gothic building that houses the Palace of Justice and has very uniform, consistent architecture because it was constructed in just six years, which is crazy when you think about the fact that Notre Dame took 200 years. (laughs) It has 6,500 square feet of stained glass, Mm. which is totally mind-boggling. I've never seen anything like that. Mm. And if you go at the right time of day, I think this also matters for Mm -hmm. time of day. So Mm -hmm. if you go in the middle of the day, you get just tons of light pouring through that stained glass, and it's amazing. Mm. Next we have the Eiffel Tower. A. Or A+. plus. You, you certainly need to see the Eiffel Tower. Um, I would say I don't think you need to be at the bottom of it or the base of it. I think there's some amazing places to see the Eiffel Tower all around the city. And I would give it an A+. plus from There's a Ferris wheel outside of the Louvre, and if you can go at night and be on the Ferris wheel and look at the Eiffel Tower when it is glowing... That, to me, is incredible. I do like your point about being able to see it from other places around the city. Mm. Because Paris, especially that part, the part that's around the Eiffel Tower, is not that built up. Mm. So it's just, it's relatively low buildings. And then just huge (laughs) structure, Mm -hmm. this huge, elegant structure shooting out of nowhere. Which is awesome to see from the Arc de Triomphe, from Mm. Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So I definitely agree with you on that. I'm going to give it an A+. Mm -hmm. I think it's really nice at dusk, especially if you go during dinner time. It's not only less crowded, but you also get to see a view from the top during day and night, mm. both of which are spectacular, and you also get to see the sunset, mm. which I got to catch at the top. Um, just make sure to pack snacks, because it takes a while sort of to get up and down, and mm-hmm. food around the area is really expensive. Yes. <laughs> it's the only huge building that you can actually say is graceful, really. <laughs> it is, and I think kind of your point about expectations, that's the one... Maybe the one thing in the entire world for me that has exceeded my expectations every single time I see it. Each memory I have of it, it's more beautiful the next time I see it. Cool. Climbing the stairs is generally cheaper than taking the elevator and Mm. has shorter lines. Did you climb when you went? I'm sad to say I did not. And there were a series of unfortunate events that led to my inability to do so. There were a few uh, strikes that nobody was allowed to climb during <laughs> during oh. that time. But I would say the view from the Ferris wheel was obviously not as high as the Eiffel Tower, but equally beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely be sure to do that. I guess lesser known views in mm-hmm. the city because there's all these structures to climb, but mm-hmm. that's one you might not think of. For the lazy folk among us. <laughs> <laughs> or just the smart folk. Among yes. Us. <laughs> last we have the Arc de Triomphe. What grade would you give for that? A B. Okay. Um, I think I'm jaded because I'm a New Yorker, so I get to see Washington Square Park all the time with mm-hmm. the replica. Um, but for me, it's less less negativity towards the Arc de Triomphe and more about it's a very, very touristy area, the mm-hmm. Champs-Élysées. And I think you can appreciate the Arc de Triomphe from a distance, but I don't think you really need to be in sort of the throes of the Champs-Élysées. There's a par- there's a French joke that no Parisians are ever no Parisians exist in the Champs Elysees besides the people working there because mm. it, it's kind of like Times Square. Yeah, I agree. Mm. That was actually the first thing I saw when I went to Paris mm. and so I was walking down the Champs Elysees mm-hmm. going to the uh, Arc de Triomphe and I was like, okay, this is mm-hmm. there's a lot of tourists in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna give it a B minus. Mm. It's oh, a good, good for histor- you. It's historically <laughs> significant. It's at the center of the city, so it's not too hard to get to. And if you go at the, you can go at night, 
at the end of the day, it's open later than most things, which is nice. Mm-hmm. But it's not the best view in Paris. Mm. There's plenty of others. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it is skippable, especially if you've done enough climbing already. <laughs> on the list of things to walk by but not necessarily go into, if you're on a short time, the Opera House, Napoleon's Tomb, and the Sacre-Cœur Basilica, which is in the fun Montmartre neighborhood. And the view from the Sacre-Cœur is very, very beautiful. You can yes. see the entire city. Yeah, and sort of far, more farther away than you would from any other typical views. Yeah, it, it definitely feels like you get to see Paris from a distance while still being in Paris. Okay. But you found that neighborhood to be a little touristy around the I, I think so. Uh, Moulin Rouge is up there, so I think that maybe adds to it. But there used, that used to be where painters could sort of just sit and sketch all day, and now there are a lot of mimes. And I think they've sort of commercialized something that was once quite beautiful but you can find corners there and there's one crepery that gives you just the most nutella in the entire world oh that's all you there so maybe you should visit for that (laughs) okay uh we're gonna get to food actually in a minute oh good (laughs) um can you talk about maybe some other neighborhoods that you like in paris that people might not know about uh i lived in the marais which is uh le troisième and it's right next to the jewish quarter it incorporates the jewish quarter uh it is not touristy at all and I think that is was very special to me because you just have local Parisians there. You have local shops. I think some of the best food in all of the city is in the Marais. And it's there's just some really beautiful, quiet spaces that are absent from the more touristy, bustling mm-hmm. parts. And just last, before we move on from sort of sightseeing to food, mm-hmm. there's a, one of the most famous bookstores in the world, as in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, Shakespeare and Company. Yeah. Yes. Uh, You're a writer, so I'm going to defer to you on this one. (laughs) Yes, I would say uh, Shakespeare and Company is a must. Uh, It's along the Seine, which is really beautiful. Um, It has a combination of English books and French books. It's one of the only places that you can get English books in France. It has a really rich history of the expats working there. Uh, I think you can go upstairs and see some of the spots. There's a piano, a few couches where Hemingway and Gertrude Stein sat and wrote allegedly and drank a lot of alcohol (laughs) and then (laughs) smoked a lot of cigarettes. Um, It's one of the rare places, I think, that holds up to reputation and that it's still beautiful and special while certainly being a tourist site. I've gotten kicked out of there as well. Seems to be a pattern. You've gotten kicked out of a lot of places. (laughs) Yes, I have. Not just in Paris, but particularly. Yeah. But yeah, definitely try to see that. It seems like it has some sort of nostalgia for prior era of artists and Paris, which is neat. It does, and they have some really rare books as well. So uh, upstairs at the piano with the more um, historical part of it, they have old books that you can only touch very briefly and then are told to put down. Um, Is that how you got kicked out? Perhaps. (laughs) (laughs) I'll never tell. Um, But I I think it's worth going. And they also are very good with up-to-date books. So if you're you're in Paris for an extended period of time and are a bookworm and feel that you need a new book immediately they will probably have the one you're looking for. With that, let's move on to food, which is a big (laughs) deal in Paris. Yes, a huge deal. It's everything. Forget the museums. I'll just let you start get started on this. What what are your favorite things to eat? Where do you like to go to eat them? That's so hard. I'm overwhelmed. Um, I think every Parisian is seen eating a baguette at some point during the day. Uh, When I lived in Paris, I went to the boulangerie, Uh, In the morning and in the evening, you usually want to time it to uh, when the bread is going to be warm. So bless their hearts, Parisians sleep late. Um, So sometimes that could be 10 o'clock in the morning or uh, 5 p.m. after work. Uh, All baguettes in all of France are one euro. Mm -hmm. Um, During the French Revolution, uh, there was obviously a lot of unrest and making bread a dollar ensured that every single family would have something to eat. It was an attempt at equality that I think unfortunately hurt the bread quality. So oh. although I love baguettes, uh, there's something called baguette tradition, which is a little darker in color. It's thicker than a traditional baguette that you see. I think the crust and the inside is just like a perfect combination of crusty but fluffy. And that's a bit more expensive. It's probably two euros, uh, but it's well worth it. And that's still not bad compared to what it might cost. Here I am. They're quite large. Yeah. And there's really no preservatives in French food, uh, which is why French people can eat all of the time and not put on as much weight. And I would say, though, at the boulangerie, you should probably get two or like one extra so you can eat on the way home and then also 
have your bread when you get home. Yeah. To serve with dinner. It's such a good picnic food. (laughs) Yes. Which picnic, like cheese, obviously. Yeah. Do you want to talk about cheese now? I would love to talk about cheese. Go ahead. (laughs) I recently discovered a cheese called Mimolette when I was last in Paris that I had never heard of before. It looks like a cantaloupe, which I I discovered after eating uh, enormous amounts of Mimolette is because because of cheese mites that uh, make the texture outside of the cheese. It sort of looks... Not like a basketball, but it has that sort of really interesting texture. Okay. But the inside is really vibrant fluorescent orange. Mm. And it is a very strong flavor. It's tangy. It's strange. There's not quite a way to describe it, but it's spectacular. There is an incredible fromagerie in the Troisième, but you can get great cheese anywhere in Paris, in yeah. a supermarket. The it's so high quality. <laughs> it's so strange, but yeah, I mean, I think when I first... To cut costs, I started getting my cheese there when I lived there and thought, oh, I'm not really experiencing Paris, but you are. The cheese, the selection is incredible. The prices are decent. It's get cheese where you can find it. You can get it on the street. I think walking into a supermarket and seeing like a two euro enormous thing of brie Mm -hmm. was one of the most shocking and exciting things (laughs) of my life. (laughs) Well, and actually the same is true with wine. I remember when I first arrived, a mentor said, do yourself a favor and pay more than two euros for wine. But you really don't need to pay that much more because supermarket wine, just like supermarket cheese, is excellent in Paris. It's great. And all these things you can picnic with and there's plenty of places around the city to sit and eat them, benches. It's mm-hmm. it's perfect. Do you want to talk about crepes now? Because those are all over the place too. Yes, I do. Um, I would say our American understanding of a crepe is the, you know, folded, very thin pancake that you have sort of on the go. But the more traditional Parisian ones, you can get at... Brege Cafe in the Troisième, uh, they have sweet and savory. The savory are buckwheat, and you can have any amazing, incredible egg and vegetables and truffle and heaven inside those. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the sweet, you get a lot of different gelatos and chantilly, uh, and those are sit-down ones. So I think the better quality crepe you sit down with, but a la the... Um, Crepe at Montmartre, the ones that you grab and go, can be just as delicious if they're loaded with good stuff. I, I thought all the ones I had were delicious. I actually yeah. didn't get to do the sit down though, so that's a good tip to try to get like even even higher quality. Uh, hard for me to imagine. But, <laughs> and if yeah. if you go to that place, you need a reservation. Any time of day, any time of year. Okay. But yeah, you're right. Any crepe is good. So definitely crepes. Yes. Hot chocolate. Another <gasps> great thing. We oui. Cafe Angelina, which is right by the Louvre. So. It actually is one of the amazing, if you get really exhausted by art, can say, oh, I can just hop over and have the best hot chocolate of my entire life. It's very famous, um, all gilded. It's a very fancy, famous tea room. They have a lot of pastries, but their hot chocolate is dense, and it's incredible. I really don't know how to well, <laughs> to say it. I was there during Christmas time, and I also have um, a special flavor with some spices, some cinnamon and chili pepper, but the traditional one is quite amazing as well. Yeah. Hot chocolate's also at a cafe is a great way to people watch and mm, anything. enjoy the time and relax. That's the great thing about French cafes. You can, all you have to do is order one small thing. You can order it on cafe for a euro, which is just a little espresso and you have the table for the entire day. No one can make you leave. Um, so you can people watch, you can write, you can read, you can do anything. You haven't kicked out of a cafe. Never. <laughs> Creme brulee, also a great dessert. Yes. I think all pétrosseries and all desserts in Paris are quite, there's something quite amazing about them. I would say with macaroons are obviously quite special. I kind of like going to really local pétrosseries that everything doesn't look packaged or perfect, but you can see the baker there um, and you see the long lines, that's when you know that that's like a, that's a solid place to go. I yeah. don't think you can have a bad meal in Paris. I would agree with that. <laughs> uh, two more things I want to touch on. Don't want to make the people listening too hungry, but <laughs> in the Jewish quarter, there's mm. a falafel place that's probably the best falafel I've had outside of Israel. I would agree. I yeah. would agree completely. And they have eggplant, which is delicious. You don't usually get it with falafel, but it, so it has its own sort of mm. flavor that's different, but I just it- thought it was... Uh, one of the highlights of my food experience. There's something about that eggplant, too. It's almost like caramelized. That is really nice to stroll around the Jewish quarter and mm-hmm. have your falafel. And that, I mean, there are lines for that, too, but it's well worth it, I yeah. think. And then the other thing was the best ice cream in town, in my opinion, is mm. Berthelon, which is on the island, I think, 
right next to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And there are fruit ice creams that are amazing, especially pear and raspberry. Mm -hmm. But also the others, it's going to be hard to convince me to get something other than chocolate. But all the <laughs> ones too. are amazing and you can eat it while uh, looking at the scent, which is obviously beautiful. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you have related to food before we move on? I mean, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> if you're looking for something that's not uh, Parisian, there is a Mexican restaurant called Candelaria in the Troisième that has delicious tacos and guac and then has a sort of dance party club in the back. And you will only find local Parisians there sort of excited about eating non-traditional French food. And uh, there's a place called Chez Genou that has the best escargot, in my opinion, in all of Paris. It is in a pesto pasta that is just, I don't have words for it. It's, it's just quite incredible. I have to go back now. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and I mean, escargot is one of the, you know, the classic French dishes. And this is the way you have to have it, I believe. Okay. Oh, and my goodness. At Chez Genoux, they have a chocolate mousse bowl the size of two basketballs that they leave at the table and you just eat it. And you just keep eating and keep eating. And it's dense and dark. And that is some of the best chocolate mousse or perhaps the best chocolate mousse I've ever had. Okay, well, I'm, I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to day trips. Mm -hmm. There are a few ones that are, I would say are absolutely necessary. Mm. So we're going to play in a word where I'll ask Janessa to describe the day trip for us in one word. So first up is Versailles. This is the famous palace of the French monarchs. What's your word? Gold. And why is gold your word? And what are your thoughts on this day trip? Um, the entire, I mean, all of Versailles is gilded. Um, it's, it's quite lovely, and I think that if you have the time, you should do it. It's a lovely train ride. There are some lines, and it's a bit touristy, but it's quite magnificent to be in the gardens and to also just see the way that these people live. I'm really interested in the French Revolution, so also understanding Marie Antoinette's life in this very magical, very removed part of France is really special, but it's very decadent. You yes. feel it's very saturated. My word is impractical. <laughs> yes. You mentioned the French Revolution. It mm. is not hard to understand why these people revolted <laughs> when you go to Versailles. One specific example is Louis XIV, aka the most lavish of all the Louis. <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted to have orange trees year-round, mm -hmm. which does not work. So he wanted to have orange trees in France, so he grew thousands of them in greenhouses. And when visitors came, he had them rolled out to the courtyard. <laughs> so that, among many other things, just screams self-indulgence about Versailles. Yes. But it is beautiful. Inside is mostly just replicas of the original furniture, but mm. the gardens are breathtaking. Mm. And you should leave time to walk around, uh, go deep, get away from the tourists. Mm. If you don't feel like you're in the maids at the end of Harry Potter 4, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is a perfect description. That's exactly what it's like. And I think especially because you're coming off of being in those very enclosed spaces with so much dense, like elaborate furniture, it's sort of beautiful to be in nature that's also still very curated. And then you just mm. get lost. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. Yeah. And the contrast, as you're right, yeah, is amazing between the house and then these gardens. Mm -hmm. So... A cool sight all around. All right, next up we have Giverny, which is a village around 40 miles northwest of Paris, primarily known for being the place where painter Claude Monet lived and worked from 1883 until his death. The sight to see here is really just Monet's house, as well as his gardens. Janessa, what's your word for Giverny and why? A uh, fairy tale. And... Nice. <laughs> because you're just... Sur you're surrounded by... You're surrounded by flowers, of course, but also there's one part of the house where you're surrounded by so many pictures, over, sort of like in a grandmother's basement sort of way, um, but is they're that, all Monet. Is that the room that sort of has some of his like throwaway practice? Yes. Paintings, probably like in the top 100 paintings that have ever been painted. <laughs> exactly. It's sort of like when, if you know, yeah, the, the place where you have your like participation trophies. Yeah. But, <laughs> Um, you're just surrounded by so much beauty. And I think when you look at the water lilies, like you said before, it's an image that we all know. It's on postcards. But actually seeing them and actually seeing these things that yeah. were painted again and again and again in every single hour and every single light, it's amazing. And it sort of lives up to the hype, I think. Yeah, I agree. It is a little bit of a trip to get there, but yeah. it's worth it. I'm going to go with picturesque for my word, mm -hmm. because it's literally exactly the pictures <laughs> that he, he painted. And, and as you said, there's a, there's a house, and you see a studio, too. 
he landscaped his property like a Japanese garden mm. so that he can paint and you see some of his influences mm. in the house. He has a lot of Japanese paintings like in his room mm-hmm. and those are still up. So it's cool to see the whole the whole place, not just the gardens. You're right though. It, it certainly is a trek and I had, again, there was another strike when I tried to go um, and so the trains can be a, a bit wacky and I think you have to take a bus to actually get there. But once you're there, it's sort of like, how could you not come? Yeah. I think. You said there were a few other nearby towns or cities that deserve some more time on their own. You want to talk, discuss those briefly? Yeah, I would say if you can go to Mont Saint-Michel, you should. Um, you have to rent a car, and it's pretty incredible to look at the view and then to see some of these just incredible buildings. And then my absolute favorite, um, but this is a bit ways away, uh, is Dijon. Uh, it's about perhaps a two to three hour train ride out of Paris and then you probably have to drive for 45 minutes but it's just incredible French countryside and in a way that you didn't realize you needed to get out of anything because Paris is so magical but it's even more magical I think to just be in France with in nature and the food is incredible I will say I had the best mustard chicken of my whole life in Dijon (laughs) and I don't think that was a coincidence nice (laughs) so we did this on our last episode hmm. for Amsterdam with Ava. So let's learn some foreign words. We, oui. uh, Especially with you being a French expert. So <laughs> what do you have for us? Uh, well, for the culinary uh, enthuse like myself, uh, <laughs> this is helpful. Uh, c'est tout means that is all or it is all. In, in French, which is kind of lovely, they, a lot of phrases or words can be questions and answers. Um, and so when you're at the fromagerie and you keep ordering cheese, uh, they will ask you, c'est tu? And you say, c'est tu? Uh, to stop and to say, that is it. I'm done. Why this- would you want to stop? Exactly. You don't. <laughs> you don't want to stop. <laughs> but sometimes they say, like, oh my goodness, you have ordered five different cheeses. It's time, it's time to stop. Okay, um, that's useful. Uh, Tessolé which is sorry or excuse me. I think that's very helpful in the metro. It can get a little cramped at times and people don't like to touch one another in France on the streets. So I think if you're walking by or if you're in a crowded space, it's good to just say désolé and move around someone. And then perhaps the most important, bonne journée and bonne soirée. Uh, Bonne journée means uh, good day or hello, it's a greeting, and then bon soirée is good evening, or have a good evening. And in France, it's very important to greet people anywhere you go. Uh, if you enter an elevator, you must say hello. Uh, and if you enter a shop, a store, anything, it's really important to just acknowledge the other person. There's a sign of respect and a sign of community, and people will really appreciate it if you do. Interesting. Is that, is that just true about French culture, and where, where do you think that comes from? It's a good question. Actually... I remember when I was, I think it must be just true of French culture in the sense that they are very, um, people keep to themselves, but they like to acknowledge the other. And perhaps that's very true of French culture of, I'm not going to speak to you further, but I will acknowledge that you're in the room. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I was taught also that eye contact can mean something very different in France than in other parts of the world. So as much as you should say hello, um, bonjour, uh, if you make sustained eye contact with someone on the metro or in a store, that is taken as a suggestion that you are interested in spending further time with them. So that is just something to be weary of or to take advantage of depending on who you meet and who you see. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Yeah. Very helpful. (laughs) Last but not least, we're going to go through some movie and book recommendations Mm -hmm. to prepare before your trip. It might enhance the trip to have background that can also maybe give you insight into culture or history. Mm. So I'm going to just have a few right off the bat. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is classic for a reason. Story is riveting and will bring you up to speed on all the French Revolution history you forgot after high school. (laughs) And Victor Hugo's Hunchback of Notre Dame is a great work of literature will provide useful background for your visit to the site. Um, but reading it's a real commitment. It has like a 150-page section about the architecture of Notre Dame, <laughs> if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, for a disney version of this incredibly dark and depressing story, <laughs> there is the animated movie, which is beautiful and uplifting and also gives you a flavor of the cathedral. Mm. And last but not least on my end is Midnight in Paris, mm. which just brings to life the world of the artist and lost generation and also gives you a really great sense of the city's culture. I love Midnight in Paris. 
Oh, it's one of my favorite movies. It's one of my favorite movies as well. Oh, awesome. (laughs) I watched it, I think, for the 10th time before I actually moved there. The night before. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, I think it does something really beautiful with playing with the cliche and romanticism of Paris and then brushing up against the actual experience and sort of when there's a little bit of disillusionment, but it's still beautiful. Um, That's a la Woody Allen for you. But (laughs) no, that's a magical movie. Yeah. Yeah, and then it also just gives you the background that you might need to, when mm. you're seeing some of the sites, like, oh, yeah, that, that's Gertrude Stein, that's what she did, that's Dolly, that's what he did, just sort of mm. quick review, almost. <laughs> that's true. Do you have any other film or literature suggestions, since you're an artist? Yes. Uh, Breathless by Godard. I think it's it's an amazing film for many reasons, but you also have an American falling in love with a Frenchman, and so I think... It's really helpful if you're going to visit to get sort of both of those perspectives. They do a lot of strolling, as I think you do when you're in Paris or when you're writing about Paris or viewing Paris. And it's very romantic and dark and lovely. Also, anything Agnes Varda, particularly uh, Cleo uh, from saint Closet, she strolls throughout the entire film. And I think it gives you a little bit of la faneur of like what it means to... Look at the shops in Paris and also to understand the internal and external world of a woman in France, which I think is a very specific experience. Certainly great recommendations on your part. Janessa, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us about Paris. Thank you for letting me nerd out about Paris. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Our pleasure. You can find links to all the things we've talked about on our website under the Paris City tab. And you can find more about Janessa and about Janessa's writing and translations at janessaabrams.com. Thanks. (laughs) Thank you. Before we get to some practical planning tips, we're going to do a segment I like to call, How About That? You think the construction in your neighborhood has been taking too long? Well, construction on the Notre Dame Cathedral began in 1163 and took about 200 years to complete. Why? A few reasons. First, there were obviously no construction companies or modern building technology. A small medieval community of mostly volunteers worked on this enormous project. First, they had to tear down the existing cathedral, which was big, but apparently not big enough. They also had to tear down the houses around it. Keep in mind, they didn't have bulldozers or wrecking balls. Then they had to build new roads into Paris to be able to transport the building materials. Then they had to actually mine the stone and bring it in. Then they had to dig a huge trench for the foundation. And only after all that could they start building. Once they did, they found that they had been a little overambitious. The tall and relatively thin walls started fracturing as a result of the stress created by the weight of the roof. So they had to build external supports called flying buttresses. This is one of the first buildings in the world to utilize these, and you could walk around the side of the building to see them pushing the walls inward to counter the ceiling arches which are pushing the walls outward. Once the skeleton of the building was in place, they still had to put in the paintings, stained glass, apostle statues, and gargoyles. So when you visit this incredible site, appreciate how frustrating it probably was to be living next to the same construction site as your great-grandparents, but also how incredible it is to have a multi-generational project that results in such a feat of architecture. From the Middle Ages, no less. Take a look at all that intricately carved stone. 200 years? I think it's a miracle they finished it at all. Okay, if you're in the planning stages of your trip, keep listening, because in the next and final section, we'll give you a bunch of practical advice and money-saving tips to make it all happen. You'll probably fly into Charles de Gaulle, the main airport. A 50-minute taxi to downtown Paris will cost about 70 euros, plus an extra euro for each piece of luggage. Airport shuttles, which will pick up several people to drop them off at different locations, will cost about half the price, but will take longer than a direct taxi. The RER commuter train that leaves out of Terminal 2 is only 10 euros and gets to downtown Paris in about a half hour, the quickest and cheapest option by far. And from that train, you can transfer easily to a subway at Gare Nord Station, for example, to get closer to your hotel. The only downside is you have to schlep your luggage on the train. Check on Google Maps before you go. There may be a bus route that goes from the airport and gets you even closer to your hotel than the subway. Now let's talk about some money-saving tips for when you get there. First, the museum pass covers many of the sites and can be brought for two, four, or six days. If you're seeing about five to six major sites, the pass is well worth it, especially since it allows you to skip some of the insanely long lines, like the one at the Louvre, and allows you to just stop into a museum for a few minutes that you might not have otherwise wanted to pay full price for. The tricky thing is that the pass has to be used on consecutive days, so look up which sites are covered by the pass, plan to see those on consecutive days while the pass is still active, and do other things before or after. With a little planning, you can save a lot of money and not be stuck in line or outside closed museum doors. The pass can be purchased at any of the museums it covers, or online in advance, but that's a little more expensive. 
we suggest buying it at a smaller museum that's unlikely to have long lines on the first day of your trip. There's a Planet blog post at www.planetpodcast.com about how to plan your sightseeing itinerary, since this could be the hardest part and can make or break your trip in this city. If you're not planning to buy a pass, you can still buy some individual tickets online ahead of time or at neighboring shops to avoid the long lines at each site. If you're really on a tight budget, there's still plenty to do. Though we strongly recommend climbing the towers at Notre Dame if you're able, the inside of the cathedral is free, as are various memorials around the city, like the Moving Holocaust and Deportation Memorials, the Paris History Museum, Carnivalet, the Victor Hugo Museum, and all the beautiful parks like Luxembourg are free year-round, and several museums are free or have reduced prices at night. Climbing the stairs of the Eiffel Tower instead of taking the elevator is not only cheaper, but gives you a closer look at the intricacies of the architecture. The Rodin Museum is cheaper if you just buy a ticket to the outdoor gardens, which still gives you a great taste of the artist's work. If you do your research, Paris does not have to be a bank buster, and you can save your money for a few sites that are most important to you. Here's some other necessary info about scheduling and transportation. Planning isn't just important if you're using the museum pass. Many stores and restaurants are closed Sunday. That's a good time to go to museums, especially since most are free the first Sunday of the month. On Monday, about half the museums are closed. The Louvre is open, but extra crowded because of the other closures. So maybe hit the Louvre really early on Monday, and then get some shopping done and head out on a day trip to Caverdi. Tuesday, the other half of the museums are closed. That's a good day to get some shopping in, or take day trips to Versailles or Gaverny. Navigating all these closures can be tricky, and our blog post gives you some ideas about how to make the most of your time. It's also helpful to know which sites are open early, like Notre Dame. If you're planning to climb, get there when it opens around 7.45 to see the inside when it's not too crowded, and then line up early before the tower opens for climbing at 10 a.m., or arrive later after the midday crowds. Most sites are open late on various days of the week. If there's any city where it pays to create a loose itinerary advance, it's this one. How to get around Paris? Paris is a beautiful city to walk in, especially if the weather is nice. Rick Steves offers great walking towards the city and the museums themselves that you can download before you go. The metro is good and worth taking if your time is limited. A book of 10 tickets is called a carnet, spelled carnet, and is a good deal if you take more than 10 rides. Otherwise, just buy tickets on a case-by-case basis. The Navego Weekly Unlimited Pass can be a good deal, but it operates on calendar week, so it automatically expires on a Sunday, regardless of when you buy it. It's more of a hassle to purchase, but if you're going to be on the trains a lot and you're starting your trip on a Monday or a Tuesday, it's worth looking into. If you're under 26, you can buy a super cheap day pass on the weekends that's worth it if you're taking more than two rides. Where to stay? The Moray neighborhood that Janessa talked about is beautiful, artsy, and not too touristy, but close to all the action, so it's a favorite of ours. The area around the Luxembourg Gardens are a little more upscale. The Latin Quarter is filled with students from the Sorbonne and is a fun neighborhood. The Rue Claire area near the Eiffel Tower is very sensual but touristy. Personally, I think the famous Hotel de Ville is the perfect location in terms of balancing proximity to all the major sites and the experience of a quintessentially French neighborhood that's not overrun with tourists. So look up that hotel and a good rule of thumb is, if you're within a mile radius of that hotel, you're in pretty good shape. The Montmartre neighborhood isn't quite as close to the sites, but is cheaper if you're looking to save money. If you can't afford to stay downtown, just make sure you're close to a subway stop. That's all for today. I'm Levi Cabas, and thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. It helps other people discover us. All of our podcasts are also now on YouTube if you'd like to listen there. Don't forget to check out our blog at planetpodcast.com, especially our most recent posts about creating the perfect Paris itinerary. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get updates on new episodes, as well as general travel tips. Today's episode was produced by Tal and Shoshana Akavis.